Good afternoon, everyone. I'm speaking to you from the unceded country of the Gadigal people. I acknowledge their communities and their elders past and present, who with patience and persistence have continued to help us understand their rights and interests in land and waters, and to help us see the truths that for too long have been hidden in plain sight. Welcome to the First Nations Speaker Series. This is a collaboration between GML Heritage the Research Centre for Deep History at the ANU, and now also Sydney Living Museums. This is a space for all of us to listen to First Nations voices. For too long, it's been us white fellas talking, but in the spirit of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, this is a space for First Nations voices and truth. The First Nations Speaker Series brings together Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to talk about history, culture, and heritage. It amplifies and elevates First Nations voices and provides an opportunity for all of us to learn new ideas and to help us better understand how we can be allies on the road to reconciliation. We are delighted today that Matt Pohl is presenting in this second talk in the series. Matt is the newly appointed manager of Indigenous programs at the Australian National Maritime Museum. Congratulations, Matt. Matt's curatorial research involves designing respectful engagement with knowledge holders and embedding consultation into exhibitions and project outcomes. His curatorial work includes the inaugural Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander collection exhibitions at the Chowchak Museum. And if you've been along, you'll see how fabulous they are. Over the past decade, Matt has worked across repatriation of ancestral remains, predominantly within New South Wales communities. And alongside his curatorial and publications work, Matt has also worked as a public art facilitator since 2005, assisting Aboriginal artists to collaborate with local councils, architects and commercial enterprise to realise a range of projects across Sydney's artistic landscape. Matt's talk tonight is titled Articulating Sydney's Aboriginal Past in the Public Realm. And Matt will reflect on new additions and historically significant examples of where consulting with Sydney's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities has built really terrific consultation and engagement programs and frameworks and templates for increasing the visibility of our Aboriginal past into future placed projects in Sydney's built environment. During Matt's talk, if you've got questions, please just pop them into the chat box. And at the end of the talk, Charlotte Feekins and Ben Silverstein will be monitoring, uh, oh, sorry, during the talk, um, Charlotte and, and Ben will be monitoring the chat box. And at the end, we'll open the floor for uh, questions and uh, hopefully Matt will be able to answer those for you. So I hope you enjoy tonight's talk. I'm really looking forward to it. And I'll hand over now to our guest speaker, Matt Pohl. Uh, thank you so much for that really lovely introduction there, Sharon. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to join you all tonight. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we're actually presenting from here today, the Gadigal peoples of the Eora Nation. Um, <clears throat> when you think of public art and the way that Aboriginal knowledges of the past have been rearticulated into so many different social spaces across the greater Sydney region today, it's incredible, it's important to actually note the incredible behind the scenes stories of so many community members who have worked behind the scenes, so many artists who have brought their inspirational knowledges, and so many um, just ordinary community members who have turned up, put so much work into the um, into the presentation of what are some of the most incredible knowledges of the Aboriginal occupation of the Greater Sydney region. Um, so much of these knowledges actually come through archaeological research, but it's only through the interpretation of contemporary community members that we get a real sense of the scale of the Aboriginal occupation. Um, more than 11,000 years, it's actually hard to put a starting date on some of the earlier spaces which we know. Um, if the image that you see on the screen now <clears throat> is a very simple um, visualization of the incredible work undertaken by Val Attenborough in the 80s and 90s, who marked just a series of sites, which is simply ones where we know that Aboriginal people um, gathered, lived, men, women and children, 
um, survived, if not thrived, in the beautiful area of one of the, of the most urbanised part of the country today. And you can actually see a bit of an overlay there in some of these areas where our, deep, our intense population centres are today and where people are living. And what's important to note is that um, there is so much of the artistic record, which is still extent across the Sydney region today. It's through an incredibly under-resourced National Parks and Wildlife Service and the Aboriginal Parks and Wild Officers who work with this organisation, who basically work in a triage capacity, um, uh, not repairing, but only getting um, the chance to work with these sites as they are sometimes exposed, as they're subject to development applications, as they're subject to being brought to light. Um, but when you think about it, the east coast of Australia, and Sydney in particular, is home to one of the largest outdoor art galleries on the whole east coast of Australia. When you think of the many Aboriginal nations and language groups who have used Sydney as a meeting space, as a space of gathering, as a space of sharing knowledge, and a space of presenting these knowledges to other language groups, uh, not just in the Aboriginal past, but also in our contemporary society today, you get a sense of um, a continuation. It's no surprise that Sydney is home to the largest Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander diaspora of people from right around the country today to do, today, um, concentrated in Western Sydney predominantly. <clears throat> so um, it's also only been in the last few decades as well that Aboriginal um, community members have felt comfortable and culturally safe to participate and share their knowledges with local councils, with uh, uh, property developers, with other stakeholders who have recognised this urgency that so much of Sydney's Aboriginal past um, was hidden or obscured. It certainly wasn't lost because once we actually ethically engage with community representatives and explore cultural reclamation in relation to the types of knowledges that we can find and the interpretive layers through Aboriginal languages, which we can place over the top. There's just no shortage of awe-inspiring and incredibly inspirational um, ways that this knowledge is represented in public spaces. <clears throat> a lot of my presentation today and a lot of the work that community members that I've worked with over the past couple of decades has been solidified in the recent uh, template which was presided by Terry Janke and company to the Museums Australia body called First Peoples, a roadmap for enhancing Indigenous engagement in museums and galleries. <clears throat> Very simply, um, a lot of these principles and ethical processes which are applied to museum exhibitions working with historical materials and collaborating with contemporary community members also translates across to the realm where non-Indigenous stakeholders are seeking to engage with representatives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations, whether they be from the Sydney region or whether they be authorised by members from the Sydney region. Um, some very basic sort of um, out key points to take away from Terry Jenke's research is the support for reconciliation and promoting that within this organisation um, to integrate Indigenous perspectives in programming. That's just not... Um, putting an Aboriginal voice on a screen, for example. It's actually bringing people into the early stages of conversations and discussions to involve their perspectives in how they not want to see themselves, but sort of need to see themselves. A lot of um, cultural institutions, for example, hold archives with some pretty, pretty um, hurtful and damaging stereotypes of the Aboriginal past, stereotypes which were authorised, authored by non-Indigenous agency. And where sometimes knowledges are present in this archival information, it's always up to the most uh, elders and the most recognized community leaders, for example, to be in charge of that decision-making process and to take and to, to be listened to in the way that they need to see themselves represented and the way that they are also responsible to their other community members. It's not a simple matter of putting yourself out there as a spokesperson on behalf of your community if you're not um, 
um, accepted in the, through doing that. So there's a real element of cultural safety, which needs to be sort of thought of way before projects are proposed or exhibitions are idealized or public artworks are sort of built. And the best way to do that is including Indigenous people in the governance of organizations as well. There's still a real need for more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members to be in the boards of governance, for example, in all of our cultural institutions, which is surprising really, considering so many institutions have such significant holdings of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges. <clears throat> but there's a real issue there with cultural safety as well. It's important not to um, place community members, as I said, in this position where they're at risk of being called out by other members of the community, for example, or they don't feel safe in terms of exploring knowledges that they might not be familiar with. And this comes back to designing culturally competent sort of teams, which is led from the top as well. Um, it's the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who work in inst institutions. There's a real need to recognise that not everything that is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander gets dumped with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff. It's really important, I think, and Terry Janke's roadmap for the Museums Australia actually really gives um, the leaders of our cultural institutions a real sense of confidence, I think, in terms of knowing that they are designing the right sort of protocols and policies and implementing them into the way that their institutions run. Because at the end of the day, quality um, outcomes are based on you know, the quality of the, the process that which is designed to work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges. <clears throat> I think some of my early inspiration for um, learning more about Sydney's Aboriginal past has come through so many different sorts of fields. Um, and for since the 1960s, for example, and the foundation of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Arts Board of the Australia Council, which was based here in Sydney, brought people, uh, leaders, um, community knowledge holders to Sydney and left this incredible legacy and this body of work, which I think is a template which you're seeing sort of spread out across so many of our other cultural institutions. Um, when you work with some of these cultural leaders, you just feel so privileged sometimes just to get like five minutes of their time because they're being drawn to designing international exhibitions, they're, you know, authorizing knowledges for use in theatrical performances, or they're, you know, sometimes getting that spare five minutes as well to work on their own artistic practice as well. Um, an incredible knowledge holder whose work I was introduced to through my work at the Maclay Museum was one Jacques Marika. Um, a leader of the Yurikala community who, and the Marikas uh, need no sort of introduction in terms of the impact of their incredible work that they have um, generously given to uh, not just the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts community across Australia, but so many other cultural institutions. But when we're talking about the Sydney rock engravings, which they are thought to be at least two to 6,000 sites, and some of these sites can have several hundred motifs within one site, um, we, I was turned to, found this um, introduction to a poetry book by a non-Indigenous author, which one Jacques had written. And he had this beautiful statement about um, the rock engravings in the Guringai National Park where he said that there is no one who can properly say why this whale or that boomerang was carved in the rock, or whether this whale is a natural whale or a supernatural whale, or even whether the shape was meant to signify any kind of whale at all. All that the living can be absolutely sure of is that the stone records were made because certain knowledges inspired their creation at certain times. It's just such a beautiful summation of something that I don't think we recognize that well in Sydney. And Luckily, that's what's actually preserved a lot of these rock engravings as well, I think, the fact that people just don't see the deep history of occupation, which is right underneath their feet. And or they see it through stone tools, which are excavated through other sort of areas. But on the surface level, we have a rich artistic vocabulary, which is no different to the Papunyatula paintings of Central Australia or the Bath paintings of Northeast Arnhem Land, for example. And it's up to the contemporary community members to be given the resources and the 
the power to explore and conserve and preserve these records of Sydney's Aboriginal past as they stand for future generations to come. <clears throat> so in my work, I've been incredibly lucky to visit sites with community members over the years. And very broadly, you can say one of the, to me, what one of the most fascinating things is that the difference between rock engravings and rock paintings, for example, which you see on vertical shelters, is that on the horizontal outcrops where rock engravings are found, um, statistically, more than 60 to 70% of the motifs are from the marine environment. It says so much about Sydney's, um, Sydney's harbour, as well as its coastline, that people are turning their attention to the, the whales, the sunfish, the um, all the different species of fish and aquatic animals, which as they exist um, in some of the studies that have been done, the rock paintings are much more figurative, for example, and their handprints and their subjective personal sort of um, depictions. Whereas on the, the sandstone rock outcrops, which exist all the way up to the other side of the Hawkesbury River, we have these um, incredible sites. Um, his name escapes me, but another elder gave a very, poignant sort of description of these is that when you're entering a rock art site, you are entering sacred ground. Um, you know that the hands of the makers who have made these thousands of years ago, in some cases, made them purposefully. And I think we need to respectfully um, recognize that today as well, and give us so much more resources and support to those community members who want to do their own research as well. There's also environmental reasons for the conservation of these um, sandstone rock engravings. If you destroy the water table underneath these um, sandstone outcrops, they can um, erode faster. Um, you know, once again, destroying evidence of Sydney's Aboriginal past. It shows you how connected all these knowledges are and how these spaces are and how one site can actually be tied into so many more of our larger decision-making processes which go into how we're, in, how we're engaging with the Sydney landscape. <clears throat> so in relation to public artists, there's been several key examples I'll go through this presentation. Um, the way Sydney works, um, the, all of these sort of larger scale projects that artists, especially artists who have linguistic affiliations with other Aboriginal nations across the country, is for them to actually work with knowledge holders in the greater Sydney region. Um, so this is an example of a public housing project, project in Redfern, where the artist Nicole Monks worked with Uncle Charles Madden. Uh, Charles Madden and his brother Alan Madden were actual sites officers for a number of years whose work left an incredible protocol template for engaging with these knowledges. And it's not a simple process of directly re-inscribing the rock engravings into contemporary context. There's an important way that they need to be interpreted and um, repurposed. Um, I think one of the key deciding factors in choosing this out of like 20 other proposals that would have come across Metropolitan Land Council's desk that day probably, <laughs> is that um, it was a social housing aspect for the people in the Redfern community to give that, that sense of identity. But you can see here just how beautiful um, Nicole has actually, as an artist, worked with this material to retranslate it into a very contemporary form, but still give that idea of the movement. Um, when you actually look at some of these motifs as well, they're not static two-dimensional beings. There's um, people stepping into canoes, there's um, kangaroos chasing each other, there's uh, incredible epic tales, I think, that sometimes you can actually get a glimpse of when you're actually approaching some of these sites. Um, the big figures of Bayami and Daramul and the brothers, um, it's just uh, astounding to sort of get a glimpse of what these sites might have been used for, whether they were, um, commonly used or used more sparingly or whether they were um, revealed to people at certain stages of their life to give them sort of understanding of different sort of knowledges as community leaders themselves. Um, I think back to another Marika family member who I worked with rec recently from the Yurikala community and he had the amazing perspective when he was working with the University of Sydney collections that 
we at the university then didn't recognize that there's professors and teachers and artists and different put sorts of roles which exist within Aboriginal communities as well. It's not a matter of a hierarchy between universities and Aboriginal communities, for example. We need to actually approach some of these communities who are incredibly strong. Um, you know, the, the Arnhem Land languages are one of the 14 languages or probably the strongest of the 14 Aboriginal languages which are not endangered today. Sadly, there's more than 100 Aboriginal languages across Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia which are um, classified as endangered. But if we don't recognise how hard fought the preservation of these cultural protocols were and how generous some of these community members are in terms of um, wanting to share that in the reclamation and the rebuilding of so many other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations across Australia, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot and not actually listening to the people who have been saying this for years, but also finding opportunities to say it at the most opportune time. <clears throat> And it's not just in Karingai as well. So when you actually, um, uh, uh, someone might like to correct me because I don't know the, this, uh, who the photographer was who's made these light images of these rock engravings. And I've used these slides a lot over the years. So I think I own some royalties. But um, this um, image here shows you just that sort of, I mean, is it a person? Is it a supernatural being? Is that actually um, a whale on the other side of this one? Um, the ways that contemporary artists and photography, for example, can actually um, respectfully translate what these knowledges are trying to show us without damaging the site um, means that there's just so much more work that we can do in the digital realm. I mean, a long time ago, you used to be able to get a scout's badge in the Garingai National Park for actually identifying and recording Aboriginal rock engraving sites. Um, whereas today we just don't have those sort of mechanisms in place. Um, Peter Solness, I just saw someone in the chat. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, but so there is the rock engraving sites themselves, but it's, it's the interpretation of them, I think is what I'm trying to explain. And the way that we can digitally recreate some of these sites, um, you know, using even augmented reality to walk around the sites without damaging them, you know, without adding those extra layers of footprints to the site, which wear them down, you know, without damage creating, without um, re-inscribing them in ways that actually are quite damaging to the long-term preservation and conservation of these sites is incredibly important. And I think from last count, there was like 12 sites officers working in um, the national parks across the whole greater Sydney region. Um, you know, this is a museum of the Aboriginal past, which exists right on our doorstep in the, in the order of three national parks, which surround the greater Sydney region. And yet, you know, it's be, be like somewhere, you know, having 10 security guards working at the Louvre. Um, there's a huge need there to resource and bring attention to the value of these um, sites for contemporary community members today. Another great artist who worked with this uh, motifs in a um, contemporary setting was the amazing Brenda L. Croft, uh, one of the founding members of the Mali Aboriginal Artists Cooperative. And these are at the Royal Botanic Gardens and sort of show the made in terrazio, like very beautiful um, permanent ways of recording the artistic sensibilities of some of these engraving sites. Um, and it shows you that with the proper consultation, the outcomes don't have to be um, as simple as re-inscribing another piece of sandstone. You can actually use these uh, motifs and designs and the, the knowledges sometimes that are evident from these sites and actually repurpose them in spaces which get huge traffic of international visitors, for example. Um, so many international visitors to Sydney still don't get that sense of Sydney's Aboriginal past and they go looking, they get told to look for it in the remoter parts of Australia. Yet if we can actually use public art to better and more ethically translate some of these artistic histories of Sydney's Aboriginal past into the public realm, it's a snowball effect. It's just there's so much potential for rectifying so much of the, the damage that was done in the way that Sydney's Aboriginal past was represented in the past in, previously. 
<clears throat> there are actually good examples though of just that simple, um, sorry. Simple one-to-one -one way that the repurposing of rock engraving, for example, can be situated in environmental regeneration projects in parks in Western Sydney. Um, this is an artist I was incredibly fortunate to work with back in 2005 and uh, followed his work for a number of years, uh, Joe Hurst, a uh, Murawari artist who has been Sydney based for about 25 years or so. And in a lot of the reclamation of parks where we're also using archeological knowledges about the endemic species to the wetlands, to the, the salt wind, coastal areas to all the landscapes of Sydney, which are actually being re-energized re re through proactive local councils and town planners who are choosing to use more environmentally sustainable plants and um, rehabilitating um, landscapes, for example. There's important ways that we can actually just give a very simple nod to the ways that knowledge was actually preserved in the Sydney region. This is in Cabramatta, for example, um, one of the amazing few projects that were done by Louise McKenzie, actually, who worked on a project which won a local government association award, the Wurali Wali project back in 2005, which I was incredibly um, fortunate to work with. Um, I don't have any other slides of Joe's work, but he's done several more of this, which sometimes actually use sandstone as a medium, which is another sort of interesting nod to the choice of materiality that artists can use when they're using Aboriginal knowledges. Um, you know, it, there's different species of trees which need to be recognised and, you know, the textures and grains of the wood. Sometimes it's just a drawing a colour palette from the types of environments where these um, sites are situated, which can be retranslated into very contemporary types of um, commercial projects and public spaces, for example. So <clears throat> another really interesting way was the use of sandstone in Barangaroo, for example. Um, this is by an artist called Amanda Jane Reynolds and Genevieve Greaves, I think, who were working with uh, traditional knowledge holders from across the Sydney region to re-inscribe several of the key motifs which are found in the greater Sydney region. Uh, this one on the left here is from the original graving, which was translated into the Australian Museum logo for a number of years, for example. And what they actually did with this too was incredibly innovative in terms of um, creating a mobile phone app, which you could scan across the engraving and it gave you a deeper layer. It had video works showing ceremony taking place and it also had that other extra layer of information which can be translated into other languages as well, which gives people a sense um, of the meaning of these things without sort of a big blatant label being plastered over the top as well. Um, the geolocation tools that we have available to us and the different types of um, virtual technologies that we can use is another amazing way that in the hands of the appropriate community members, we could be um, documenting these sites and preserving them at the same time in really innovative ways, which also just feeds back into that story of what we need to be doing as, um, as facilitators or as curators or just general community members who have that thirst for knowledge about Sydney's Aboriginal past. You know, how do we get that? Um, dusty old information and in a thick archaeological text and actually condense it into a way where it's, you know, transmissible to thousands of people and new audiences that wouldn't normally come across that information. So as a starting point, the rock engravings have been translated into several really interesting projects, whether they be physical sculptural installations or, as you can see with this one, um, a much more virtual experience based on the knowledges that were learned. I think part of this project as well was a workshop where younger people were actually trained with elders in the process of sandstone engraving. You know, it's an apprenticeship in um, masonry in the same as any other sort of field like that. <clears throat> and to get back to the international visitors, I mean, these drawings by Charles Alexander Lassieur um, from the Potts Pot region, Potts Point region, um, just show the, um, 
the maritime influences, as well as these incredible beings which are depicted. Um, the stories that must be associated with them, this is actually a picture which is a conglomeration of several different sites. Um, but and you can see the landscape and you know, the Aboriginal language name for Points Point uh, Willara, um, where these, um, it's very likely that these sites have actually been destroyed. And we've actually seen that in the records numerous times over the years that um, so many spaces where Aboriginal people left their knowledges for future generations have been destroyed. And you know, that has impacts in native, native title cases, for example. If you destroy the evidence of the Aboriginal past and a community group wants to go to a native title tribunal and argue the case, well, they'll point to well, where is the evidence? If that evidence has been destroyed through um, just you know, being destroyed, there's no simple way that community can actually um, challenge that. And it's where um, terra nullius is actually reinforced again. Um, to just to go back though, I mean, you can just, some of these ones were actually used, the top one in the top corner there, I'll get to that a bit later, was part of the Westmead project, the borough, the eel, um, borough matter, the place of the eel increase site. Um, and they've been sort of adapted by community members in incredibly empowering ways. Um, but getting back to that broader story of how do you actually not just represent the Sydney story, but the national story of the experience of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia today in a way which does justice. Um, we can look to a really uh, fantastic example at Sydney International Airport, for example. Um, a lot of these designs, which were used by the artist um, Archie Moore in uh, 2016, I think, for the International Terminal, were recorded by the um, ethnographer R.H. Matthews, who was a Sydney-based ethnographer who actually recorded a lot of Southeastern Australian knowledges at a time when, and before anthropology or archeology span were even proper fields in Australia, but when so much of the Aboriginal past was being authored by experiences out in central and the Northern parts of Australia. And for this work, which I think is an incredible work by Archie to actually use some of the motifs which are found in sand drawings, in dendroglyphs, in petroglyphs, in body painting designs as they are found in different parts of the southeastern part of the country to give that sense of a um, the rich artistic vocabulary which existed across many nations. Um, just even the choice of the use of flags to depict these motifs as being from many nations, which is how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people see themselves across Australia today. Um, we can look to so many great examples. And today I'm only really touching on a couple of the ones which I'm familiar with, which are the tip of the iceberg. There has been an incredible cultural renaissance all across the greater Sydney region where you can see Aboriginal knowledges and Aboriginal languages which have been translated into design choices and into architectural interventions. And um, these templates are actually being used all across the country. Um, a lot of local councils in other parts of the country, for example, can look to these examples as ways of engaging with the local Aboriginal knowledges, artistic vocabularies, and um, contemporary identities of the people who are living in the many different parts of the country today. Um, so I, I only raise those as highlights because for so long, New South Wales and Sydney in particular, with Sydney being hit first and hit hardest by the colonial enterprise, it was really genuinely taught in our schools that there was no Aboriginal history of the Sydney region. And we actually do have an incredible history which we're at the forefront of reclaiming across the greater Sydney region today. And once we actually step back and look across the way that this is also reverberating across so many other parts of the country, I think we're at a really interesting time in seeing how we can actually use these knowledges moving forward. Uh, one of the first ones from 1988, because um, it's also prior to 1988, there actually weren't that many um, public artworks per, as per se, which used, well, for one, had Aboriginal artists making them, or for two, used Aboriginal knowledges. It's interesting though, because when you look at the history, um, the logos and insignia, for example, from local councils and other uh, 
public entities, they actually are using the motifs of the boomerang and Aboriginal people, the very stereotypical one of the Aboriginal man standing, holding, leaning on a spear with one knee bent, for example. So while there was this huge use of Aboriginal iconography, which was made by non-Aboriginal artists to depict Australianness, it's only really since 1988 and in Sydney since 1988 that works such as The Edge of the Trees by Fiona Foley and Janet Lawrence have actually started a whole new conversation into um, public art and the way that Aboriginal knowledges are depicted in the public realm. There was a few disagreements about this work between the artists and its manufacturer as well, but it's also stood the test of time. And it was also one of the first ones which used the incredible resource of Aboriginal languages, which was given by Patagarang to Lieutenant uh, Dawes in, uh, around 1791 in the early Sydney region. Um, the way that language is, offers an important way for knowledge holders to protect their knowledge uh, really needs to be recognised as well. But it's also a way for non-Indigenous people to, to learn in a cultural safe way what type of knowledges pertain to different parts of the country. And through the simple act of learning these language words, we do get a deeper sense of how um, important and how, um, how deep the connection to the Aboriginal landscape was, how people learned from the landscape, but also how they translated those ways, those knowledges that they learned from the landscape into things like their language and into song and into performance. Um, another great sort of example, I'm sort of focusing on a couple of the acknowledging country sort of ways here. So you have a great one at the Australian Museum, for example, which is another example of an archaeological knowledge. Uh, the Willandra Lakes footprints that were found several decades ago and depict a group of people running across a mud flat 20,000 years ago um, with the consultation of community members was repurposed into the entranceway to the Australian Museum. So in a sense, when you're walking across that entranceway into the museum, you're following in the footsteps of those people 20,000 years ago who left that incredible mark on the Australian landscape. That's not too far away from where Lake Mungo is, for example. And, you know, there's, it's for another presentation as well, but the impact that Mungo Man and Mungo Lady had on our knowledge of the Aboriginal past of Australia was one of the most transformative experiences in the last 20th century as well. And it was interesting to see just recently, a coin uh, was, a 20 cent coin was minted, um, we're talking from the mint today, um, to show this incredible um, knowledge, which is just embodied in the representation of this simple footprint. Um, you know, it's a motif that you see quite a lot in contemporary painting, and you also see handprints and footprints in the pecked rock engravings from different areas as well. So it's amazing to sort of see the circular nature of how handprints and footprints and the way that we can depict these types of knowledges of the past in the public realm um, bring us back to an important way of understanding just the deep long held occupation of Australia and how it's actually so um, important to so many people today to, to get it right, you know, to not pay lip service to um, these knowledges and to actually translate them in ways which are incredibly much more special for people. Um, another simple one which was done was by Brooke Andrew Warang. Um, it points to the shoreline. Um, so much of our contemporary landscape that we walk around today, we actually need to realize is reconstructed landscapes. So it's not a case that uh, there's always some archeological knowledge on it. It may actually be an extension of the harbor, which is the case here in Circular Quay. Um, when you look at the language word for warang, which is the word that Brooke has used in this work, you actually see that warang area means the other side of the harbour. So there is not, it's one of the beautiful intricacies of Aboriginal languages that um, they don't often designate place, but they um, tell you an experiential knowledge of that place. If you're standing on one side of the harbour, Warung is on the other side. And if you're standing on this side of the harbour, Warung is on the other side. It's the journey between the two, which shows you what Warung is. And it's not surprising that the Sydney Harbour Bridge is actually built on that spot, Warung. You know, one of it's the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who travel across it. 
um, uh, recreating and you know animating that word warung just through the act of crossing the bridge. So it's not a case that we've overwritten the Aboriginal past when ethical and consultative work takes place with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. There are amazing ways that we can just embed that knowledge into the purpose of the place that we're attempting to, to, to depict, whether it's through public art or through basic public utilities like bridges. <clears throat> to get back to that use of insignia, like when you go through the Australian War Memorial, for example, there's just so many insignia that have boomerangs and Kui, an Aboriginal word from the Sydney region. Um, there's, I could, I could list quite a lot actually. And the first public artwork um, in Hyde Park uh, that was made by the artist Tony Albert, um, Thou Didst Yet Fall, um, is a beautiful acknowledgement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander servicemen. Um, when you think about it, we have an Anzac memorial practically in every town all across the country. Um, yet we have no memorials to the Aboriginal soldiers who fought on behalf of Australia as well, let alone any memorials to the frontier wars which took place in so many other parts of the country. If we, in the 1930s and the 1950s, we could build hundreds of these um, memorials to our um, soldiers who participated in World War I and II, I think it's the least we could do to actually continue that project into acknowledging our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who fought and in many times laid down their lives to protect their country as well. <clears throat> Just to simply get back, um, there's just no shortage of incredible ways that we can look at the knowledges that are gleaned from um, rock engraving sites and um, share it with all sorts of different sort of audiences, but also to recognize that there are incredible knowledges embedded in these rock art motifs as well. This is drawing on the work of Ray Norris and the CSIRO who looked at the emu, which is found in the Elvina uh, rock engraving site in Garingai National Park and worked out that it actually aligned with a, uh, at, during September, um, it aligned with the emu in the sky, which is the negative space within the Milky Way and connected with some oral histories from that site as well. Um, who knows what else we can actually find if we can find astronomical knowledges embedded into some of these rock engravings through a more detailed understanding of why some motifs are positioned in relationship to others or why some are pointing in some direction as opposed to other directions. Um, and, you know, there's incredible ways that sometimes the rock art motifs have actually um, been reclaimed by contemporary community members. This is Uncle Charles Madden again, who um, made these shields um, for the, as an acknowledgement of country for the Australian Museum. You know, and it's not just a simple matter of um, going out into the national park and finding a piece of wood because that's actually illegal as well. There's a huge process that goes on behind the scenes in terms of traditional of community members applying these traditional knowledges and recognizing the protocols of working on, another, working on another language group's country. So the permissions that need to take place and the way that we need to better recognize the incredible work that our people from the Office of Environment and Heritage and Heritage New South Wales and um, National Parks and Wildlife Service are doing. But the amazing way that people like Charles Madden have actually turned rock engravings, which is presumed to be a shield, or it could be a Nawi as well with the struts across the bottom, or it could be a shield with a picture of a Nawi on it, and actually retranslated that into a three dimensional contemporary art object, which is a depiction of that shield. Um, is something that's just so easy to do and something that um, needs to be done authentically and ethically and appropriately. Because with all of our knowledge holders, they I find, often find working with community members that they are desperate to see this work, to pass this knowledge on to the future generations, but the timeframes involved and the way that they're sort of undertaken just don't afford them the opportunity to do that well. These are just some more examples um, from the early historic record depicting those type of shields. Um, and you know the paint patterns which are on them, the white and red, that can be an inspiration for artists as well who are you know, choosing a color scheme for uh, some aspect of a building or some other area like that. <clears throat> 
Um, sometimes the knowledges are found in the most um, ordinary sort of places. Um, you know, shell midden sites were actually incredibly common in this greater Sydney region. And within midden sites, you often find these um, barra um, shell fish hooks. Um, you can see the process of them being made from a turban shell here and worn down. Um, the stories of Aboriginal fishing um, and the very, very early depictions of these fish hooks show us how they were made, but also how they were used without bait and how much and why the harbour was such an um, important site for not just food gathering, but for socialisation and for the transfer of knowledges in relation to fishing. And, um, you know, there's, to go back to the story of Barangaroo, she was a fisherwoman. You know, it wasn't a gender disparity in terms of people using the harbour in these sorts of ways. Um, and I think this has been um, proposed. It's actually being manufactured now, from what I know, part of the new City of Sydney Eora Journey Trail. Um, and there's a new trail which connects all the way from Woolloomooloo to the other side of Piermont Bay. Um, which has been curated by Emily McDaniel of the Powerhouse Museum. And um, to see something like a simple fish hook um, from the Sydney region translated into Carrara marble is just another example of how the materiality of these knowledges doesn't have to just be um, ordinarily, you know, plunked in place. There's actually beautiful ways that artists are actually some of the best translators of some of these archaeological data, for example. And, you know, it's fantastic to see how something as simple as a fish hook can actually be such a powerful marker of place and of history. Um, just to sort of keep moving on a little bit, I mean, last year being the 250th anniversary of Cook's Landing in Australia, um, there was a number of significant sites, and I don't need to sort of go into the separate um, sort of projects which people have done unpacking the, the ways that monuments have become flashpoints um, and how especially 19th and early 20th century sculpture, for example, of um, heroizing different people, historical figures, many years after they've um, made their impact on history have been important flashpoints for contemporary community members today to voice their concern. Um, <clears throat> Cook is another classic example. In 1938, you can see the picture there, which is actually Cook's cottage in Melbourne, but it was brought brick by brick, um, even the Cook Society and, you know, built in a park in Melbourne in 1938 for the sesquicentenary of Australia. And um, even the Cook Society acknowledged that Cook may have set foot in the house once, <laughs> you know, our idea of, um, uh, turning the story of Cook into this heroic narrative has got some very um, quite funny sort of historical precedents. And um, I wanted to show these ones just in the sense of how it was counteracted last year by the artist Alison Page out at Cook's Landing site in Cornell. Um, the land and the sea, uh, the eyes of the land and the sea project, which was created by Alison Page and Nick Lashishik. Um, as a counterpoint to the obelisk sort of marker, which has stood there since I think the 1970s or possibly earlier um, at the Kernel site. I mean, for such a foundational space in the history of contemporary Australia, it's staggering to think of how underwhelmingly it is represented, how, how underwhelming it looks. I mean, if you look at the broader Kernel Peninsula, it's a Caltex refinery. Um, you know, read that what you will. But um, for these spaces in Australia where we do have even contemporary layers of history which need to be told well, I think it's only through turning to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artisans that we can actually get a much more accurate understanding of the past. Um, and just finally on that idea of monuments, I mean, I really like the idea of what Banksy proposed last year with the Edward Colston statue, which was torn down by protesters. And he actually wanted to keep the statue, but actually turned the, the protesters staring the statue down into bronze as part of the reinterpretation of this, you know, showing a contemporary layer of information over the top. Um, you know, there's really creative ways that artists can um, use um, contemporary social flashpoints as opportunities to educate um, not just um, people from different countries, but people from the future as well about, you know, what is really going on behind the scenes and the thinking behind some of these moments.
Um, and you know, the history of protest and how that has been an artist in the Sydney region can be traced back to day one. Um, in the 20th century era though, the, the flashpoint of the National Aboriginal Islander Day of Observance Committee um, gives some background to that idea of the protest aesthetic as it sort of pertains to how so many artists don't want to you know, challenge the past, but want to um, recreate that moment of um, activism, you know, and to not shy away from the complex and sometimes hurtful histories that that activism is speaking against, um, you know, and not just whitewash it with a, a, a contemporary layer or a mural or different sort of things like that. Um, there's really important ways that we need to sort of let people from the Aboriginal community guide this process and to use their community knowledges in ways um, which have profound impacts. I mean, so many of the public art projects we've seen in the last couple of decades are tied to NAIDOC events. Um, the, it is during NAIDOC week when so many of these um, spaces have the opportunity to tell an incredibly new story. Um, it probably wasn't on the minds of the original NAIDOC week protesters that um, they would be influencing public art in Sydney so profoundly more than or nearly a century later. But when we look to the history of consultation and why it's so important, there's just so many great examples to see of where Aboriginal people have always been telling us these things. And we need to find better mechanisms to actually build that voice into the interpretation of contemporary Australian society. Um, you can also see that in other sort of um, aspects of Redfern, for example, the really beautiful work here by Adam Hill on the outside of Gadigal building, which was um, uh, a depiction of the Kevin Gilbert play, The Cherry Pickers, um, you know, one of the first Aboriginal plays to be written by an Aboriginal playwright and performed in uh, that location when it was a different building. Um, you have Rico Rennie's Welcome to Redfern there as well. Another simple playing off the colour palette of the Aboriginal flag, but repurposing it into one of the last remaining buildings from that block of Redfern and turning it into a monument itself of the housing that people lived in in the Redfern area. <clears throat> and it's important not to forget that there's an incredible history of activism around the modern redevelopment of the Redfern region as well. <clears throat> I think I'll just, we're running a bit out of time, so I'll just add on these last couple of ones. <clears throat> but it doesn't actually have to be a physical monument, I think is where I was getting as well. When you look at Jonathan Jones' amazing work for the 32, 32nd Caldor Art Project, Barangol Diara, it was a simple outline of the, the garden palace, of the building, which was the garden palace, which burnt down in the 1880s. Um, you know, at the time it destroyed this huge assemblage of artifacts from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, um, from East Coast Australia. Um, <clears throat> and that sort of was carried by so many community members for years in the sense of this idea of loss, of there being um, you know, no evidence of the Aboriginal past because it was held in overseas museums or it was destroyed in the Garden Palace fire. But what the great thing about Jonathan's work for this project was, all he did was outline a space. And the way that he activated that space was through three weeks of um, lectures um, you know, dances by Bangara. Um, he turned it into a physical performance space in which Aboriginal knowledges of the contemporary era could thrive and were turned into, um, to show that, you know, nothing was lost because um, heritage only exists in people. So through providing a platform for contemporary community members to um, practice their knowledge or their artistic practice on a stage such as this, is an important way that we can actually um, create not monuments to the Aboriginal past, but social spaces where the Aboriginal past is activated and brought into the present. Mm -hmm. The very last example I think I'll show of that as well was the amazing work by Nicole Monks and Uncle Charles Madden uh, for the Sculpture by the Sea a couple of years ago, where a rock art motif was um, turned into a performance piece. Um, the outline of the whale shark was actually um, built into the beach and with two community representatives from the La Perouse and from the Metro Land Council, um, the work was actually set afire, set alight as a durational performance piece. Um, you know, it was a motif from a rock engraving, but it wasn't a, 
um, a reiteration of that, which was stamped onto some permanent place. It was actually a very beautiful way of performing an acknowledgement of country as, part, as a sculptural piece in itself for something as significant as the Sculpture by the Sea Festival. So I think in conclusion, I just wanted to end on those two examples to sort of show that Aboriginal as knowledges of Sydney's Aboriginal past are incredibly potent and they need to be um, carefully and cautiously translated into the public realm, but through um, a sort of a going slow process and letting these projects bubble up from within the community themselves, I think you find incredible outcomes which are beneficial for everybody in the community and for all of us in the Greater Sydney region today. Um, I think I'll leave it at that and maybe take a couple of questions if there's any time left. Thank you. Thanks, Matt, um, for such an inspiring, fascinating and powerful presentation. Um, so the chat space has been very active. Uh, there's lots of great comments uh, that have been coming through and perhaps we have time for a couple of questions. So the first question that I have uh, comes from Ross and he says, Matt, could you name one or two Sydney sites that visitors could visit that would be safe and respectful? I think in terms of... Um a rock art site, one of the ones that's sort of been designated, and there's a couple of these, but the Elviana track site in Garingai National Park, um, it, you know, it's designed for visitors in that sense. And I mean, I think they preserve a lot of these sites by cover, letting the overgrowth cover up ones which may not be for public viewing and actually pushing people towards different areas. Um, that's just one of the sites that you'll find at West Head in Garingai National Park. and. Um, in Val Attenborough's book as well, you can find a little guide to visiting several sites. Um, I think the true test is if it's in a national park and it's well signposted that it has been consulted with and it's probably an ideal one to see. Um, and I guess the second one would be the, the new walk which is gonna take place from the Botanic Gardens or Woolloomooloo across to Piermont and actually you know, experiencing that shoreline which is very different to the way it was before, but the way that contemporary artists will be translating historical knowledges of Sydney's Aboriginal past in all those works will actually be something that's pretty exciting to see. Thanks, Matt. Thank, thanks, Matt. Um, there, there's a number of other questions, um, but I think we've only got time for, for just one more. Um, this is a question from, from Grace Caskins, who, who writes, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, at many major rock engraving sites in Western Sydney, Dear Robin, the images have now become very faint and they won't be visible for much longer. Uh, knowing that uh, NPWS is underfunded, but this is urgent. Do you, do you think there's any way these spiritually significant sites might be refreshed by traditional owners uh, as they would have been um, previously? Um, it's another shout out to an amazing person, Grace Caskins and her people of the river, which was an incredible resource I've used a lot as well. Um, yeah, look, I think what an amazing project for young people though, to be documenting those sites and for the knowledges of the rock engravings as they are in Western Sydney, which is something I'm not hugely familiar about. And, you know, to understanding what different stories they might be telling us to the stories which are depicted in the coastal rock engravings, for example. Um, I couldn't urge enough anyone who's in local council or different sort of areas like that to find ways to work with the Western Sydney community representatives to create not research projects, but community activated projects where they get the attention that they deserve and the right people who can make decisions about better resources for those spaces can be connected with the right community members who want to see them um, preserved in whatever form. You know, and it could just be, you know, starting out with a simple uh, digital photography project with young people, you know, and working on country with elders. Any opportunity you get to actually match the younger generation with these old elderly knowledge holders in the community, um, council should be falling over themselves to make them happen. Thanks, Matt. Do we have time for one more? Okay, this is the last one. This comes from Sammy. What can people do in everyday life to protect cultural intellectual property? Um, just learn, you know, read, um, find published material, you know, 
do your literature reviews, do it properly, you know, don't do your own research, but just um, find ways to actually, you know, learn because there's no shortage of good stuff. And, you know, once you actually put that filter on, then, okay, this was written in a particular time period. So there may be some unethical sort of barriers to using the knowledge which is found in that. But the more that we actually, um, yeah, work with this historical information and let it filter itself out into that which is useful and that which isn't. Um, I mean, I'm always surprised that there isn't more um, education opportunities, you know, using Sydney's Aboriginal past in, um, or not just in school contexts, but in all sorts of contexts. It's only through public artworks that I think that a lot of people actually get the chance to learn about Sydney's Aboriginal past and we need to find much better channels of sharing and communicating information. Thanks, Matt. I think over to Sharon. Wow, what a, what a presentation. Thank you so much, Matt. I think we've all learnt um, a considerable amount tonight about the rich history and presence of Aboriginal knowledges and cultural and, and creative expression. And certainly all of those things can enrich not only our experience and understanding of being in the world, but our civic empathy, to uh, quote from one of my favourite historians, Inge Glendening. And I think it's that civic empathy and understanding as we work together towards reconciliation in a respectful and safe fashion where we can actually get to some truth telling and respectful acknowledgement of how extraordinarily rich our history and heritage in Australia is. So thanks for joining us for the First Nations speaker series. This is the second talk in that series and we look forward to bringing you a new talk um, in coming weeks. Thanks so much. Enjoy your evening.